Good evening and welcome to the May 8, 2018 Brevard County Commission meeting. We have a quorum up here, so I'll call this meeting to order. And if you would, uh, pause with us for a few minutes for a moment of silence. Commissioner Smith. Would you stand and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Commission, we have April 10, 2018 minutes to approve. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Barfield, second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you. We are moving into resolutions, awards, and presentations. We are honored tonight to have the family of Agent Kevin Stanton with us. Jim and Katie, if you guys would come up and we're going to read a resolution for uh, Kevin. This may be the safest place to be in Brevard County tonight. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Brevard County Sheriff's Office and citizens of Brevard County suffered a great loss when Agent Kevin J. Stanton was killed in the line of duty February 17, 2018. Whereas Agent Kevin J. Stanton was an honorable man of God, an incredible family man, a great friend, and most importantly, an honorable and decorated law enforcement officer who truly loved and served as a deputy, deputy sheriff. And whereas Agent Kevin Stanton's career began on October 29, 2007, where he proudly served as a patrol deputy, field training officer, and agent, assignments that he truly loved. And whereas Agent Kevin J. Stanton worked as a deputy sheriff in one of the most dangerous and challenging professions of the world today, which requires special training, sound judgment, and courage. And whereas Agent Kevin J. Stanton provided essential services and the highest of professional standards through his commitment to the citizens of Brevard County and Brevard County Sheriff's Office, now therefore be it resolved that the Brevard County Board of County Commissioners does hereby recognize Agent Kevin J. Stanton for his outstanding and dedicated service unselfish commitment, and ultimate sacrifice to Brevard County. We extend our heartfelt condolences to his family, friends, and co-workers, no matter what color of uniform, shape, or badge, done, ordered, and adopted on this eighth day of May, 2018. I uh, move to approve this resolution. Second. Second by Commissioner Barfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Katie, would you like to say a couple things? Uh, just thank you for everything that <laughs> everyone's done for my brother, even though he would not like all this attention. But <laughs> he was a really good guy, and I looked up to him. He was a good guy. He was a good person his whole life, and mm -hmm. you guys are a wonderful family. Mm -hmm. So just thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
We have another resolution I'm going to um, read in just a moment, but law enforcement, you are so appreciated in this community and in this county, and I know I'm speaking for the county, county commissioners up here, and I know they'll, they'll probably say this again in a few moments, but I, I just truly thank you with all my heart for everything you guys do for our community and the sacrifices you make. You're, it's truly appreciate it. Mr. Sam DeBoslio, are you here? Come on up. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for all you've done. Whereas the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 4428 Titusville, a nonprofit 501c3 corporation, organized the Friends of the Cemetery for the purpose of funding improvements to the Veterans Cemetery at 1143 Day Street, Titusville, Florida, and requested the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, to grant permission to the Friends of the Cemetery to furnish, install, and maintain improvements at the Veterans Cemetery at 1143 Day Street, Titusville, Florida. And whereas Friends of the Cemetery partnered with the Brevard County to ensure the Veterans Cemetery symbolizes significance and dignity due to those who have served their country and who are buried at the Veterans Cemetery. And now therefore be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida recognizes Friends of the Cemetery for landscape and grounds improvements at the Veterans Cemetery and recognizes Friends of the Cemetery for continuing to honor those who have served our nation by providing a sense of beauty and peace at the Veterans Cemetery. Then ordered and adopted in this regular session on the 8th day of May 2018, I move to approve this resolution. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. And if you would say a few things, sir, but first I I want to thank you for your dedication. You have taken a, a, a part in the community that um, wasn't very loved for a while, and you have just pulled tons of volunteers around you, and you have just already done an incredible job at the cemetery, and I, th I thank you with all my heart for that. This is a small cemetery in the center of Titusville, but it belongs to Brevard County. It's run by the Brevard County uh, office here in this building. Um, it was in shambles, and it's been that way for years, and it goes on and off, on and on. And we decided we were going to make permanent improvements to it, and we've put about $12,000 into it already. So um, if you've never been there, it, it deserves a, a drive up there someday. If you're in the area, uh, stop by 1143 Day Street and go all the way in and see what we've done. Uh, I have some pictures here, but I didn't want to interrupt anybody to put it on the screen. It was an honor for us to do this uh, for the veterans that are buried there. There are only 127 veterans there. They'll never bury there anymore. They used a veteran cemetery up on US-1, the National Cemetery. And it was an honor for us to do this. Uh, we included two Eagle Scouts in our program, and they both have fulfilled their requirements for Eagle Scout. So hopefully by midsummer or fall, they'll have their Eagle Scout award. And um, we, we enjoyed it. It, it was uh, very, very worthwhile for the community. Well, you've certainly done a good job and thank a, you. a very noble job. Thank you. Well, thank you for your support. All right, it's my, my honor to recognize this as Law Enforcement Memorial Week. Nobody could have ever guessed that, right? Okay, whereas members of Brevard County's law enforcement departments proudly protect and serve the citizens of Brevard County, and whereas working in law enforcement is one of the most dangerous and challenging professions in an ever-changing world. Yeah, I don't think that job has ever been easy but, boy, in the, the world that we exist today, we all up here, and I'm sure everyone here, take our hats off to you for the bravery and the commitment that you bring to the job. 
Whereas, by pro presidential proclamation and congressional resolution in 1962, May 15th has been designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the calendar week encompassing May 15th as National Police Week. And whereas, since the inception of Police Week, law enforcement officials and supporters gather each May to honor and pay tribute to those who have fallen. And whereas, Brevard County pays tribute to the 16 law enforcement officers fallen in the line of duty. Their courageous efforts displayed an enormous amount of valor, commitment to duty, and heroism. And whereas, we pay tribute to the fallen law enforcement members of Brevard County as follows. Lieutenant Roy D. Blake, Coco Police Department. Lieutenant Amos Cox, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Officer Jack Henry Schnell, Titusville Police Department. Officer George Hanchy, Kennedy Space Center. Officer Joseph Stephen Pelicano, Melbourne Police Department. Officer Ronald Midgley Grogan, Palm Bay Police Department. Officer Gerald Douglas Johnson, Palm Bay Police Department. Deputy Robert Nicole Jr., Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Officer Stephen Franklin House, Titusville Police Department. Officer Charles B. Autry, Cocoa Beach Police Department. Officer Philip Jeffrey Flagg, Satellite Beach Police Department. Sergeant Ernest Edward Hartman, Satellite Beach Police Department. Deputy Raymond E. Warner, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Deputy Lucille Ross, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Deputy Barbara A. Pill, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Agent Kevin J. Stanton, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Whereas the names of these dedicated public servants are engraved on the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., and whereas recognition and remembrance of our fallen officers should be commemorated each May 15th in Brevard County. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, does hereby proclaim May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week of May 13th through 19th, 2018, as National Police Week in Brevard County, and we salute the service of all our law enforcement officers who protect our communities and safeguard our republic. Done, ordered, and adopted in regular session this eighth day of May, 2018. Madam Chair, I so move. I have a motion by Commissioner Smith and a second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I call for backup? Yeah, yeah. thank you guys. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to call for backup, so everybody come on down. While our team's coming down, and I know we have um, Chief Lau here from uh, Titusville. Chief, come on down, buddy. Uh, um, I want to first and foremost thank you for rec recognizing um, Agent Stanton um, with the resolution earlier. As everybody's coming down, I, um, I also want to thank our community, certainly thank our commissioners our county manager, um, everybody for the support that we get at the sheriff's office and law enforcement throughout Brevard County. I've come upon a saying that I, I get to say quite often, I'm very proud to say, and that is we're blessed to serve as law enforcement officers in Brevard County where our citizens love us, trust us, and protect us just as much as we love, trust, and protect them. So um, having that is a blessing to us. Having that kind of support means the world to us. And on behalf of the 1,500 men and women that I get the honor of serving with, on behalf of all of our law enforcement officers, um, first responders as a whole throughout Brevard County, um, we thank you. We dearly, we dearly thank you for that. Um, I have, um, I'm going to ask Chief Waller to come up, uh, if he will. And uh, as part of um, the earlier resolution, we have a presentation that Chief's going to make to the um, Stanton family, if, if you'll permit us, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, actually, I have uh, Chief of Staff for Senator Nelson's office, Helen Miller. And she is here to do a special presentation to uh, the Stanton family. If we could ask the Stanton family to come forward, please. All right. It's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. At the request of Chief Waller, a, um, an American flag was flown over the Capitol in honor of your son and brother. And the certificate reads, the flag of the United States of America. 
This is to certify that the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol on February 23, 2018. At the request of the Honorable Bill Nelson, United States Senator, this flag was flown in memory of Deputy Kevin James Stan for his sacrifice in the line of duty, February 17, 2018. Madam Chair, um, the last thing I would say is um, uh, the job that the men and women standing behind me and throughout our agency, throughout our profession do each and every day is um, very challenging. As Commissioner, as you said earlier, it seems like it's even more challenging these days. But um, uh, for the citizens of Brevard County, um, they have a great team out there that's protecting them each and every day. And, uh, and that goes for all of our partners and each of our law enforcement partners throughout this county. Every one of them out there working hard, and, and we certainly appreciate the recognition today. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, Commissioner, you want to be in the front or the back? I'll be in the back. All right. It'd be nice with that remains. We'll do all the requests. Everybody just kind of curve around here. I think we'll, we'll be able to get it. I guess we can photobomb this one, huh? We're going to photobomb you guys here. Yeah, yeah. Do <laughs> 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 you have the officers on the side of the room or deputies on the side of the room? Scooting. Like, really cool. And then you can also go up on those stairs as well. Hey, Sheriff, step on his foot. Smith. Andy Holmes, John Denninghoff, Yuri Rodriguez, Jim Hellman, would you all come down front please? Yeah, you are. You guys can come right front and center. You don't get to stand over there. The stalwarts of our staff. Everybody wants to stand in the middle. <laughs> there we go, Andy. Okay. Whereas the American Public Works Association, also known as APWA, is an international educational and professional organization established in 1960 that works to promote and perpetuate the use of best practices with regard to public works related services. And whereas the APWA continually works with national, state, local, and local agencies to improve public awareness with regard to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs including water, sewer, streets, highways, bridges, stormwater, public buildings, and solid waste collection. And whereas these efforts are celebrated annually through the establishment of National Public Works Week throughout North America, this year focusing on them the power of public works. And whereas National Public Works Week calls attention to the men and women who provide and maintain the public works infrastructure and who serve the public every day with dedication. Now therefore be it resolved 
that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida does hereby proclaim the week of May 20th through May 26th, 2018 as National Public Works Week in Brevard County, Florida, done, ordered, and adopted in regular session this 8th day of May, 2018. Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion. And a second by Commissioner Barfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. Thank you. And congratulations. Well, there's only five of us standing up here, but there's probably close to 500 employees that are involved in public works, and we get to be the face of it tonight, but there's there's many other people who seven days a week are, are out there working for the taxpayers and for the county, and, and we appreciate that. And that's really who the credit and who this Public Works Week is all about. And we also want to thank the commission for your leadership. And every time you fund a project or a, a maintenance expense, you extend trust to all of us, hundreds of people. And we, we don't take that lightly, and we really appreciate that. And it's an honor to serve. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you. Bill Booker, and, and anyone else you would like to bring up? Come on, girls, don't be shy. Okay. We're going to recognize Child Welfare Professionals Recognition Day. Whereas children are Florida's most precious resource and are promised for a bright future, and whereas Florida's child welfare professionals are responsible for ensuring that our children live free from maltreatment, are physically and emotionally healthy, socially competent, and that families nurture, protect, and meet the needs of their children, and whereas Florida's child welfare professionals build rapport and trust with the family, empower family members by seeking information about their strengths, resources, and proposed solutions, and demonstrate respect for the family. And whereas, Florida's child welfare professionals form partnerships with biological and adoptive parents, relative caregivers, and foster parents, and lead all involved parties to achieve optimum communication, clear roles and responsibilities, and mutual accountability. Whereas Florida's child welfare professionals make lasting contributions and are sincerely dedicated to improving the lives of all children. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, does hereby recognize May 14, 2018, as Child Welfare Professionals Recognition Day. Done, ordered, and adopted in regular session this eighth day of May 2018. Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion to approve this. I have a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Barfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you. Mr. Booker, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you again for the recognition. Um, about a year ago, the Board of Directors at Brevard Family Partnership uh, directed the company to create a new subsidiary which would have 100% focus on case management in Brevard County and Brevard County's children. And so we're only 10 months old as an organization. But already in that short period of time, um, our staff of 86 uh, child welfare professionals from our transporters to our case managers, our supervisors, our leadership team um, has successfully seen over 500 children achieve permanency in the 10 months that we've been in operation with 100% focus on Brevard's children and families here. So thank you for the recognition. It's not every day that child welfare professionals are, are recognized for the hard work and effort, so thank you for that honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Sheriff Ivey, front and center. <laughs> We're going to bring everybody down again? Well, I will be glad to bring them down or I will forego it. You tell me what you prefer. No, I'd like to have them up here. They need All right, hang on. I got to call for backup again. I need backup. We want to give you folks all the recognition we can. Where's Demora? Uh, Mike's out of town. I think he's um, uh, went to, to visit a family member out of state. We should take this opportunity to embarrass him. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'll get even. <laughs> all right. Whereas the citizens of Brevard County are privileged to have a group of brave men and women who are trained professionals who serve on a daily basis unarmed in the Brevard County Jail. And whereas these men and women are certified through the Florida Department of Law Enforcement upon completion of a corrections officer's state exam. And whereas the Brevard County Jail houses inmates, both sentenced and pretrial, on charges ranging from misdemeanors to capital felonies. And the daily management of inmates requires special training, sound judgment, and courage. And whereas working as a corrections deputy is one of the most dangerous and challenging professions in the world today. And whereas these corrections deputies and corrections supervisors provide essential services and exemplify the highest of professional standards by their commitment to the citizens of Brevard County and to the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida does hereby unanimously proclaim the week of May 6th through 12th, 2018 as Correction, Corrections Officers Appreciation Week and encourages all citizens to recognize the demanding and unselfish commitments made by our Brevard Corrections Deputies done, ordered, and adopted in regular session this 8th day of May, 2018. Madam Chair, I so move that we pass this resolution. I have a motion and a second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Again, um, thank you for recognizing our, our members for the hard work. Um, all too often, uh, people think that when you work in the field of corrections, your only responsibility is to make sure that those, um, those that have been incarcerated do not get out. Uh, the reality is that we're responsible for taking care of them. We're responsible for making sure that they are in a safe environment, that they uh, have the things that they need, and that working with our court services to, to uh, get them through the process. The team that we have at our um, Brevard County Jail is second to none. They are truly, truly um, dedicated and committed individuals that go to work each and every day knowing that they are going to be surrounded by, quite frankly, what is the worst of the worst criminals in our community. They work hard each and every day. They do it professionally. They do it with respect, and they do it with honor. And uh, again, I am truly, truly um, honored as well to get to serve with them, to, uh, to get to be a part of their agency because they do an amazing job out there. So um, thank you for recognizing them. Thank you for uh, passing this resolution. Thank you. All right. Everybody get back in the same spot. <laughs> I know I was right here. I'm not taking your husband on you. Everybody in? Here we go. I know you're working tonight, but get in. You're still part of the group. <laughs> Madam Chair, could I just share one other thing with our audience? And uh, this, this coming Saturday, starting at 9 o'clock, um, right, uh, right over here at Vieira High School, we will be having a law enforcement and first responders um, parade. 
that will be taking place. Each of our agencies in Brevard County will be participating in it at the conclusion right out here in the uh, parking lot by the uh, retention um, area will be um, the Battle of the Badges with uh, barbecue, uh, chili cook-off, and also a cupcake challenge, which I have volunteered to judge. So um, <laughs> if, um, if anybody has the time and would like to bring their family, please come join us as, as um, we start kickoff Law Enforcement Appreciation Week. So, and, that, thank you guys. and that is beyond the call of duty. So I, Yeah, you know, when you have to judge cupcakes, it's tough, but I'm going to do it. It's <laughs> sacrifice I make. So thank you, guys. Thank you. I um, have, that's, okay, we're moving to consent agenda. I don't have any cards for consent agenda, so we'll approve it all with one motion unless the commission would like to pull any to discuss separately. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to register dissent without comment on 2B2 and 2B3, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'd like to, oh, Commissioner Barfield, you want to pull it or? No, I'd just like to uh, recognize Scott Nelson, who's now going to be over Transit oh, Authority, yeah. who's promoted. And we also will have a, a new Public Safety Department Director in uh, Matthew Wallace. And congratulations, and congratulations, Scott. You, I, I've worked with you ever since I've been here, and I just want to thank you very much. So. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good call, Commissioner Barfield. So I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to approve consent agenda with the two... Um, Items that Commissioner Tobio would like to have a no for, by his name on. So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Smith. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. We have no public comment cards, so we're going to move right into public hearings. Item 4A. And I do have one card on this, Mr. Pence, if you would come down and be ready. And Ms. Barker is coming to the penalty box. <laughs> Got it to work that time. You hit it hard enough. Okay, good evening, Commissioners. This is the first reading of an ordinance that would establish a 150-day limited moratorium on new conventional septic systems or any system which does not provide a minimum of 65% total nitrogen reduction located on the barrier islands, including Merritt Island, and within 50 meters of the Indian River Lagoon and connected waterways countywide. And I'd like to provide a little background. Um, we've had a number of calls in our office, and I know some of the commissioners have had a few calls in your offices as well, so to try to um, make sure the public understands what this moratorium does and does not do. Um, nitrogen is contributing to the pollution in the Indian River Lagoon system. Nitrogen loading from septic drain fields is a recognized source of pollution in the Indian River Lagoon through groundwater pollution migration. For the Indian River Lagoon waters in Brevard County, it's been determined that septic drain fields contribute approximately one-third of all new nitrogen pollution into the lagoon. When recycling of nutrients within the lagoon is also factored in with the new sources, uh, septic systems are still responsible for over 18% of the total nitrogen pollution. A properly functioning conventional septic system is designed to treat human pathogens but it only reduces nitrogen pollution by 30 to 40 percent. In adverse conditions, reduction has been measured at zero to 20 percent. The best available studies estimate a 10 percent reduction in nitrogen with a properly maintained functioning tank versus an improperly maintained tank. The remaining 20 to 30 percent of nitrogen removal occurs in a properly located and functioning drain field. There are existing scientific studies that support restricting the use of the typical low-performing conventional septic systems in environmentally sensitive areas. Requiring higher-performing septic systems where it's not feasible to connect to sewer could provide immediate additional protections to the Indian River Lagoon. 
Fortunately, there are alternative septic systems designed to specifically reduce nitrogen through multi-stage treatment processes. These are already in use in Brevard County, and the industry is rapidly growing. According to the Brevard County Health Department and the Florida On-Site Wastewater Association, there are many alternative septic systems, such as NSF-245 certified aerobic treatment units and engineered performance-based systems, which can be installed to reduce total nitrogen and effluent by at least 65 percent. This performance standard of 65 percent is also being considered by the state in impaired spring sheds across central Florida. Attached to the agenda packet were several lists provided by the Florida Department of Health on septic systems available off the shelf right now that meet the 65 percent nitrogen removal performance standard. The moratorium as written would not limit to development to just the units in these lists. The lists are for illustration purposes only to show the variety of choices currently available. The moratorium simply sets a performance standard of 65 percent and any system permitted by the state that can be certified by an engineer to meet the standard would be acceptable to Brevard County. The local planning agency heard this item last night. There was no public comment, but considerable discussion by the LPA. A motion to re recommend the moratorium failed. Members said they supported the idea of an ordinance, but they were concerned about how people, the septic industry, and home builders will be affected by the timing of the moratorium. There were multiple members who recommended an extended grace period for implementing any change. A motion to deny the moratorium until the LPA receives further input was approved unanimously. However, there was strong support for bringing back an ordinance with new septic tank rules in five to six months. The moratorium is temporary, up to 150 days. Its purpose is to provide time to develop a more informed ordinance to address the impact of septic systems on the lagoon. Ordinance preparation will consider the appropriateness of the 65% total nitrogen reduction standard and refine the overlay area, looking at risk factors including proximity to a surface water connected to the lagoon, depth to groundwater, density of development, age of the septic system, as well as soil, hydrologic group, organic matter, porosity, hydraulic conductivity versus dispersivity. Staff will also evaluate the feasibility of expanding sewer service to areas of high risk for septic pollution, consider how to address hardship cases, as well as identify potential funding sources to prevent social justice implications. So the moratorium is, is attached for your consideration. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Roy Pence. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Roy Pence at 300 East New Haven Avenue in Melbourne, Florida. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this quick proposal that has a tremendous impact on the property owners in Brevard County, on many property owners, and the future of the lagoon. And which are a lot of homeowners. Uh, I happen to serve on the technical review and advisory panel of the Florida Department of Health, which was established by the legislature in the late 90s. And I've been on that committee uh, appointed by the Florida Home Builders Association, representing developers uh, since it was its inception. So in that role, I get the opportunity to review all state ordinances that committee does that are proposed that affect the on-site disposal system rules and regulations in the state. All the studies that the state undertakes, all the studies that are brought forward, the millions and millions and millions of dollars that are spent in studies to determine the effect, how they could be improved, and whatever changes might be needed. So I have a rather extensive, long background in the process of making rules for on-site systems. And I would first like to support the position that the LPA has taken as far as slowing this process down a little bit. You know, it's less than a month's time after the ordinance was, was advertised that you're going to vote on it to implement it. And a far-reaching ordinance like this, especially the broad geographical area that it's proposed to cover, it has, that, that's pretty quick to get the proper analysis of it. I really don't think you can. But the other thing that's, that's really apparent 
to me in, in looking at the ordinance, and I've talked to the people who drafted it, and you're part of Natural Resources and the Brevard County Department of Health, who played a primary role in drafting it, as I understand it, is, is we keep talking about the on-site treatment and disposal systems. And part of that is the, the treatment unit, the, the tank, or the, in this case, an ATU, the public treatment unit, and the other part of that is the drain field. This ordinance, as it's drafted, and as, as we've heard, the drain field can provide up to 20 to 30 percent reduction in the nitrogen from an on-site system. As I read this ordinance and as I have been uh, discussed with people who drafted it, basically that reduction does not take into consideration in this ordinance. The ordinance is requiring a 65 percent reduction in the treatment unit itself. There's a big difference in the cost, the functionality, the complexity between the treatment unit that provides 50 percent reduction to one that provides 65 percent. There's a tremendous cost. The 65 percent treatment units are relatively new and they're slowly getting approved and uh, they're just at least twice the cost of one would do 50 percent. And I would urge you to, as you stated in your agenda report, that you consider it an entire system, not just a treatment unit. That if we're going to have a 65% reduction, which I'm not talking against, I'm urging you to consider the, what the entire system provides. Don't require it out of a treatment, out of a tank, out of an aerobic system. And if you go into a, a performance-based aerobic system where you have to have an engineer design it and certify it and survey it, you know, the, the costs are exponential to and the complexity and the time frame to get it done. So you can get your 65% by doing that today, or you can go through a system that's already been designed and approved. The National Sanitation Foundation provides a testing mechanism for these systems. They certify how much the, the treatment is provided, how much nitrogen among the other pathogens that might be in the, the fluid is, is removed. And there's many more systems that are provided that reduce 50% at 65 percent. I would urge you to do what you said you're going to do in your ordinance and in, in the Commission discussions uh, since this was first started and recognize the treatment that's provided by the, by, the, by the drain fields, which are going to be properly located and sized and everything else under your ordinance and they're going to provide the proper separation. Thank you. Thank Chairman. you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Roxanne Grover. Good evening, ma'am. If you would state your name and address for the record. Um, yes, Roxanne Groover, um, 5115 State Road 557, Lake Alfred, Florida. Um, once again, thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity. I am currently the executive director for the Florida On-Site Wastewater Association, the co-author of the one of the white papers that you used to have some discussions. Um, we have had the opportunity to have the Indian River Lagoon Group come to our training center and look at some of the available technologies. Um, I also sat on the Research Review and Advisory Committee, which is similar to Mr. Pence's um, DOH, where we're looking at the research that actually goes over to the TRAP Committee before we go into rules. I have also sat on every one of the BMAP OSTDS Remediation Committee, so I'm an engineer by training. Um, one of the things I would certainly encourage you to do is possibly slow down this process just so we can make sure we have good rule policy. Um, this is very, very similar to what is happening in the Springs Protection based on the water bill um, that we are looking at an implementation date of July 1st of this year, 2018. And one of the things we are seeing is some challenges with how are we going to implement this. I would echo Mr. Pence's discussion point. We have several technologies. If you look at every technology that's out there, including some of them that were part of the Fosner study, which is a $5 million study that was commissioned by the state um, to look at some of these passive systems, we would have about 30 systems available. Unfortunately, several of those systems have not been incorporated into the rule right now. We had our first public hearing on April 16th to look at what they originally called the Linard system. Um, there is now an unlinered system. In fact, 
Thursday a week ago, we actually put that in at the training center um, to see exactly how well that could be installed. That's one of the passive systems they talk about. That also tends to be where the 65% reduction number comes from. When they did initial studies on the passive liner system, they felt pretty comfortable saying that that was going to be a 65% reduction on total nitrogen. And as Mr. Pence stated, that is from the input of the tank to the treatment through the soils. And so I would certainly encourage you to look at not only the treatment unit itself, sometimes we call them the magic boxes, but also the accompanying treatment within that drain field. Um, if you use NSF, and I also sat as a joint committee member on NSF 40's wastewater um, protocol board where we write those rules and um, protocols, and we have about 25 systems that have passed through NSF 40, um, several that have passed through 245. We weren't really looking at nitrogen reduction um, 20 years ago, but if you take those 20 existing ones, you add on a properly sized drain field using drip irrigation, low pressure pressure dosing and shallow, um, you'll realize you far exceed that 65. If you move into your 245s and you add on the additional, um, you could be upwards of 85, 90 percent reduction. So you just have lots of options out there. I would hate to see um, some kind of rulemaking go forward that we're not prepared for. The, the industry perspective, the DOH perspective, the funding perspective, there's a lot of different challenges out there. In fact, I will be meeting with the DEP on Thursday morning to have some further discussion on opportunities um, for better funding for these OSTDS systems. So um, I just think we have a, a lot of room for good potential rulemaking. I just not, I'm not sure if we're there yet. I think the intent is good. Um, but just looking really briefly at that ordinance, I, I think we have some opportunity to um, look at some other options, make sure we're all prepared to move forward and, and understand where we're going with this and the implementation with it. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. right. That's all the cards I have on this item, so I'll close public hearing commission. Any thoughts, motions, or? Oh, Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just had a couple questions. I think they're probably best directed uh, to Ms. Barker with your uh, Please. approval. Uh, our, the, the study that we did, I think it was done by Tetra Tech. I'm going to need your interpretation on it, if you could help. Um, what I got out of it was nitrogen loading impact to the lagoon decreases by more than 75 percent when we look from 50 meters to 200 meters. Did I read that correctly? No, that's, that's correct. On average, that's correct. Um, to follow up on that, do we have any research that goes, that looks at the diminished uh, nitrogen past that 200 meters? My understanding is this moratorium would deal with septic tanks that are much further than 200 meters. Do we have any research that indicates that impact? There's a, a state approved model called Arc Inlet that looks at all of the, the factors. Um, so the, um, the Tetra Tech document is based on averages, but there's a, the performance of those systems within 50 meters is highly variable based on a number of factors. So there is a model that looks at um, a dozen or so factors. And part of what we would um, intend to do between now and when a, a, a permanent ordinance was brought to you is to go into that model and look at those more specific factors to better refine the, the overlay area that would be most appropriate. So you could use that model to estimate the impact of septic tanks that are a mile away from the lagoon as opposed to 200 meters, is that correct? Yes, but it would probably be more effective at differentiating uh, those between 50 meters and 200 meters. Um, okay, thank you. Um, do you have any idea based on last year's numbers of, of 
um, residences that uh, applied for septic permits uh, of how many uh, would be impacted for for this moratorium here no I do not uh, okay the ordinance makes cites two papers to support this ban is that correct I believe the ordinance included multiple citations yes okay um, the ones that I, I, I was assessing the impact of sea level rise and precipitation change on aquifers in low-lying coastal alluvial plains and barrier islands east coast Florida my, I, I, I went through it what I missed was the reference to septic tanks um, did I did I miss that or is does that I, I what I got out of that again I did very poorly in biology but does that that was research about groundwater groundwater movement on under barrier islands does that have anything to how, how does that yeah, relate so to that, septic tanks um, so as both speakers um, talked about you have a certain amount of nitrogen rejection that happens in the tank then you have more nitrogen reduction that happens in the drain field then you have more nitrogen reduction that happens in the soils between the drain field and the water table and in the soils as that water as that groundwater moves through the soils from wherever the septic drain field is to the nearest water body and so it's that movement of polluted groundwater underneath barrier islands that is the issue and so that paper talks about the movement of groundwater under barrier islands okay thank you um, uh, and can you help me with the second one? The, sec the second one that was there was looking at uh, Cape Hatteras and looking at the impact, I think, of septic tanks on Cape Hatteras. Um, are there differences in soil composition and geology with Cape Hatteras and Merritt Island, or are they a fair representation of each other? There are some similarities and some differences. And would those have an impact on nitrogen seepage into um, into the lagoon yes I guess it all comes down to this uh, you know is there any science that you are aware of that backs up that a properly functioning non anaerobic septic tank a mile and a half from the Indian River Lagoon will have any measurable impact on nitrogen into uh, into the lagoon we would have to look at the the flow path of when that groundwater is intercepted by a ditch or canal and how quickly it would make its way to the Indian River Lagoon and what natural attenuation processes would happen along that pathway so it's a, it's a time and and distance equation okay uh, that, that's how you would that's how you would conduct that but my, my question is is has anyone done that is there any research any scientific research that says a conventional system a mile and a half away from the Indian River, River Lagoon and I, I understand that's how you'd set up that model but is there any been done because we're, you keep on you, yeah you tell I don't know you, I don't know you're not aware of any okay thank you thank you sir Commissioner Barfield I think some we're losing it somewhere here that the fact what we want to do is a moratorium and the reason we want to do the moratorium is so we can get a grasp of all this research and so we can create look at the, the new regulations we may need to put in look at our land use management look at all the research all the other uh, aspects of this before we ever uh, put in something the point is this we're right now 33 percent of the lagoon new nitrogen is coming from septic tanks I hear people about the developers I hear what other people are saying here but the point is this it's time we go ahead and do this now take a pause and go create these standards we need to put in place there is excellent research one of the speakers said that's out there 
Um, we can do that. But the point is this. If we keep putting off and putting off, we've been doing that for 40 years. Why do we want to keep putting it off? The point is we might as well go ahead and do it now, go ahead with the moratorium, get the research, get all our ducks in a row, and then we'll, we'll come back to this commission and, and come up with a, a, a path forward. But the time is now. We can't keep putting this off. We know what the situation is. We all know what the problem is. So why aren't we going in and addressing it? So, Madam Chair, with that, I make a motion that we pass this moratorium. Second. I have a motion and a second by Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Isnardi. And I'll just say I understand both sides of it because I wouldn't be opposed to, to um, some septic regulation, and I think I made that position known last meeting. My concern, again, is, is, is making a decision, and we're waiting several months to get some feedback on how we're going to, what details are going to be in that decision. And it makes me a little nervous, you know, because I, I hesitate to, to make an important decision such as this like with the moratorium before having some solid data behind it. And again, you know, this all boils down to, I mean, this commission hasn't delayed anything. I think we're all acting pretty quickly, but this all boils down to one thing. If, if, if we would just commit to getting everybody on sewer, we wouldn't be even be discussing this. So instead of set, spending five months on and deciding on how we're going to handle it and, and, you know, what kind of crazy septic tanks we're going to put in place that cost twice as much as, as standard septic tanks, we should be talking about how we're going to finance the next sewer treatment plant to avoid all of this. So I'm not going to support it for that reason. I think we should spend equal time and equal commitment to getting those sewer treatment plants in place. And we have the money to do it, just not the will. Well, I, I think we have different paths to get there, but I'm on board, too, for getting those, those items up and moving. I would request, as, as we are um, about to vote on this, that you guys would do your best to come back maybe in 120 days or 90 days instead of 150 with, with um, where we need to go with this process. But this is just, um, just, just stopping what could be put in right now that would cause more damage you still can build you're just going to have to make sure you have these standards right now and hopefully we'll come back with with a good formula here to move forward on so i have no more lights so um i'll call the vote all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed nay. nay passes three zero with commissioners is nardi and commissioners to buy to buy an objection moving into just for clarification, this item will come back on May 22nd for the second hearing. Oh, thank you. I should have read that a little better. Okay, we're moving into unfinished business. Item V. And Commissioner Tobias, are you leading us into this, sir? Or? No, Madam no, I think it's Chair. Okay. Can you help us doing this one? Oh. It's that who's leading. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, item 5A is a request for the Board of County Commissioners to provide direct direction to staff regarding the implementation of code revisions addressing tiny houses on foundations and tiny houses on wheels. Um, the staff is seeking direction specifically with the expansion of locations to allow tiny houses on foundations and whether or not tiny houses on wheels should be allowed as a permanent residence. And also, if so, the degree of construction regulations that the board feels is appropriate for tiny houses on wheels and where those should be located. We have a um, brief PowerPoint presentation we'd like to run through real quick to kind of help some of the conversation. And then based on the outcome, we would be bringing back an ordinance that would um, be the summarization of what the board decides tonight. So with that being said, I'm going to let Aaron run through the uh, PowerPoint. I also have Mike McCon, the building official here, if you have any questions regarding construction standards and stuff like that. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair. Um, Tiny houses are residential structures between 100 and 400 square feet in size. They rarely exceed 500 square feet. Uh, there are two types of tiny houses, those that are built on a permanent foundation and known as site-built tiny homes. 
and tiny houses on wheels, which we commonly refer to as THOS. So you'll see that in the, the rest of the presentation. Uh, currently, site-built tiny houses are permissible in certain residential zoning classifications as guest house units, which are buildings that are accessory to a primary residence. So we do have allowances in our code today for small structures. Um, guest houses do not have a minimum floor area restriction and they do not have uh, restrictions on separate or they do have restrictions on separate electrical meters and on renting the, the guest house out. So that it's not a separate residence behind another residence. Um, those, though, are not permitted to be used as a guest house. Um, those are currently considered as recreational vehicles and are permissible within the RVP, Recreational Vehicle Park, zoning classification, but they have a limit, a time limit on their stays. So they have a 180-day time limit, so they're not a permanent residence. Uh, they're also permissible in the Recreational Vehicle Park Destination Resort Zoning Classification, which has a 50-acre minimum size requirement, but that does not have a time limitation on stays. Thank you. So um, for tiny houses on foundation, uh, this is basically the key factors that we'd like you to consider summarized on this one slide. So tiny houses on foundation, the board should determine if minimum floor area requirements in, a, in current zoning classifications should be either reduced or eliminated to allow for tiny houses. The board also has an option to create a new zoning classification to allow for tiny houses. And then for tiny houses on wheels, the board should determine if they should be allowed as permanent residences. And then if so, the board should define those in the code, uh, determine the degree of construction regulations and establish those in the code, and determine what zoning classification is appropriate for them. So we, as staff, have drafted a definition of a tho, if you were to consider that, um, and that's on your, on your screen now. It defines it as a structure built on a single chassis and mounted on wheels. It's intended for use as a full-time residence or year-round rental property. And it is not a mobile or manufactured home or park trailer as defined by Florida statute. Uh, those must be towable by a vehicle and cannot be designed to move under its own power and they must be in compliance with size and weight limits for vehicles on public roads. So that's a proposal that we have and that, that can be tweaked or amended. Uh, what that definition does not include is uh, options for construction standards. So if the board were con to consider those in a zoning classification, uh, we've proposed a few options for the board's consideration. Uh, those are on page four of the report, but summarized here on the slide. Uh, they, option one is to require a uh, connection to water, sewer, electric, and comply with electrical codes. That's the least restrictive option. Option two would be to define criteria uh, or the criteria from option one and to establish minimum living area standards and require engineering for anchoring. And then the third option is options one and two combined and the adoption of the 2018 International Council tiny house provisions and require that licensed engineer certify the that the construction meets the code and was constructed to ASCE engineering standards. So they get more restrictive as you go on. And then for the location of tiny houses, we put together a few options, um, which there are many options. Technically, you can allow them in every zoning classification we have, but we've put together a few that, that seem to be a good fit uh, for discussion. Uh, the first one is to see a tiny house development. We have a PUD and RPUD zoning classifications uh, today, um, and in order to allow for tiny houses within them, um, the board would need to change the minimum floor area requirement, which is currently 900 square feet in PUD and 800 in the RPUD. So if those were um, less restrictive, then a tiny house could be located there. Um, but that's a tiny house on foundation. So if the board was to consider allowing for those in an RPUD or a PUD zoning classification, um, the board would need to consider several more things, um, which is, uh, 
those other standards before. The board could also consider uh, reducing the minimum acreage requirements in either zoning classification, reducing the minimum lot area requirements, and removing the requirement in RPUD that single family lots along the perimeter mirror the lot size of surrounding property. So lots of things to consider here. The next option uh, could be either um, it could come in as a subdivision or as an infill lot um, by amending existing zoning classifications. And so we picked two of them that allow for single family homes that have the smallest minimum floor area sizes. But again, you could, you could open up any zoning classification. So option two uh, provides, uh, staff broke it down into two options and evaluated the zoning classification that had the house size with the smallest minimum living area allowances. Tiny houses on large lots could be considered in AU or GU. Those both have 750 square foot minimum floor area requirements and tiny houses on small lots could be considered in RU17 and that has a 700 square foot minimum floor area requirement. Um, the board could also consider allowing those as a permitted use in any existing zoning classification. And then the last option for locational criteria is to create an entirely new zoning classification. Um, in order to do that, we'd ask the board to consider defining or not defining a minimum floor area. Um, the board should consider defining a minimum lot dimension and a minimum acreage. So, uh, and then I think we'll leave it to y'all to ask us some questions and we're here to elaborate. Thank you, ma'am. We do have a speaker. Mr. Mike Cheatham. Good evening. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, the commissioners, the building department, planning and zoning, and anybody that had a part in putting this potential change together. Uh, I see many faces here uh, that were at our open house uh, just, just recently. Uh, first of all, I should start with my name. My name is Mike Cheatham. Uh, I am the owner of, one of the owners of Movable Roots Tiny Home Builders. We have the tiny home outside that some of you were able to tour. And uh, I see some faces here that were just at one of our open houses a couple of weeks ago that the biggest question that we have is where can we put it? We want to we wanna downsize. We want the option to live this way, but we don't have an option to put it somewhere. <clears throat> uh, the journey for myself uh, and my wife started about two years ago uh, on a personal journey to, to do that exact thing, to downsize, to kind of find a way to not be tied down to a, a mortgage that we felt like we had to work all the time to support, to pay utility bills for that home uh, that we didn't necessarily need all that space for. So we, uh, we started kind of touring some tiny homes. We started going to some tiny home events uh, and we were ready to make this transition, bought a piece of property and then found out that we couldn't place our dream tiny home on wheels on that piece of property. So we kind of hit a speed bump uh, in our, our big plans. And uh, so we, we had to kind of drop back and, and punt, so to speak. So that's where the business side came from us, for us. So at that point, we decided to build homes for potentially other people that didn't have maybe the same regulation issues or the same uh, restraints that we were uh, held to here locally. Um, <clears throat> Currently, uh, as they stated in the uh, process, uh, the only option for us locally to place a tiny home uh, was in an RV park. And we weren't 55 and older, uh, and so that wasn't really an option for us. And then the fact that we would have to move it every 180 days just really wasn't something that, that we were looking to do. Our home base is here. <clears throat> we knew the potential for change uh, in the code and zonings was 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 here we we knew it was we knew that uh, Rockledge uh, had recently uh, in in the last couple of years had approved a tiny home community um, there was a, a group that that started that uh, that worked with the commissioners that worked with the planning and zoning department there that got it approved 
Uh, unfortunately, they ran into some hiccups with the piece of property, uh, and that, that development is somewhat on hold because of that. Um, but there's over 6,000 people on a single Facebook page for Rockledge Tiny Home Community for potentially 15 spots on a 1.5 acre lot. So there is a big need for this potential change in zoning and development. <clears throat> um, we shared the information about tonight's meeting uh, being proposed on our social medias and it got shared internationally. It was shared, we've got messages from people all over the US saying, hey, update us on the, you know, what happens tonight, we'll relocate ASAP. So this is something that is definitely a, uh, a need and we feel like Brevard County could really be some pace setters here and show a pathway for other counties and areas around the US to make these changes. <clears throat> As a tiny home builder whose main focus is throws or tiny homes on wheels, uh, we welcome regulation and inspection <clears throat> uh, to ensure that our builds are both safe for living, sleeping, and as well as potentially going down the road at 70 miles an hour. Uh, there's a saying that your tiny home is going through a hurricane and an earthquake at the same time when it goes down the road. <clears throat> so, we currently as movable routes are certified uh, by Pacific West Associates as a custom RV uh, manufacturer and they require us to build homes to an ANSI code of 11195 uh, as well as um, an NFPA code for life safety. And um, we're required to keep quality control logs, PW, PWA inspects our place of business uh, and we also have the ability to take multiple photos and things like that uh, on our builds. We also have uh, third party um, inspection companies uh, that can inspect our uh, builds to uh, the Appendix Q uh, standard as well uh, that they brought up about the building code. So I think I'm out of time, but uh, I would just like to say that um, we hope that Brevard can be a huge part of this growing movement and set an example for others. Um, People from all walks of life and age demographics are looking for this opportunity as someone who personally wants to downsize and have the opportunity here in Brevard. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. What have you? I don't have any lights on, so let me let me ask you a question. Here, the tiny houses, the foundation ones, I'm just like totally good on. So I'm ready to roll with them. I, I still have some questions about the ones that are on wheels. I think for me, what I would like to do if we do the tiny houses on the permanent, that we would go ahead and make a new zoning. I think that would be uh, my preference. I think it'd be easier to do that. You guys can come up with, with what zoning we want to do that's appropriate. I, I love what um, the other city did and has already set up a little community of these. With the, the, the ones that are on wheels, let me ask you this, because it, it sounds like an RV to me. So help me to differentiate with this. What's the downside for the county if we made this a permanent housing and it was on wheels? What's, what are we looking at as a downside of this, and is there one? I don't know that there would be one other, you know, we have um, mobile home type developments now, I, I think that it would just be how they, how you chose to provide locational criteria for them. Okay. Um, I, I think that would be key and I think that the other thing would be that right now there is no oversight of the construction standard for them. Um, so if you were to look at those, you'd probably want to have some sort of construction oversight. So option three, which you have here with most regulations, you have some items under here where the construction has to be certified by Florida. Would that take care of your concern right there? I, I believe that it would, and I think it's also in line with what uh, Mr. Cheatham is doing now as part of their business practices. Okay, so from where I am, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Um, the, if we would go ahead and make a new zoning district would be, would be my preference, and that um, we go with option three as far as the uh, ones on wheels 
and I, I think that is, is mine. As long as we, we do the maximum suggestions you gave in here with the options, I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's pretty cool. So, Commissioners, Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cheatham. I was in Lynchburg, Tennessee a few years ago, and uh, it's the home of Jack Daniels. We got through the tour, and I expected to get a little bit of a sample, but they said uh, Jack Daniels is actually headquartered in a dry county. And I think you have that same problem. Here you have a wonderful product and nowhere to put it. So um, thank you for you know, uh, risking your capital uh, in order to provide a service for other people. And I'm sorry we were in the way, and hopefully we can get out of your way. Um, I want to speak to a couple of things. First of all, the, this board just did away with a minimum square footage on hotel rooms. Uh, I, I certainly hope that I don't, I, you know, Tad, uh, first of all, I'd like to also thank uh, Tad and staff for this pretty comprehensive report. Um, Many times what we do in government is we go steal good ideas from other municipalities, uh, other states, and there really was nothing out there. So you are looking at a unique product that will put us on the forefront uh, uh, of this uh, movement. And I know it took a lot of work and a lot of time uh, by you and your staff, and I greatly appreciate um, the product that has come forward. Um, you know, my suggestion would be on the foundations that we do exactly what we did with the hotels, that we just do away with the minimum square footage. I don't know why we would need to create a new uh, zoning class in order to, uh, in order to do that. Um, Chad, if we were, and, and, and three is a good suggestion. I, I, uh, option three is a good suggestion. Help me. Um, Ted, how would it work if movable roots is a great product? Um, but what happens if I'd already purchased one and it was located in Georgia? Um, would, how, how, would, uh, how would it work as far as getting a Florida certified engineer? Would I have to send a, a you know, certified engineer up there to check it out? I don't know that you would. I think that they would be able to certify it based on the plans that it was designed to um, in Georgia. The, the challenge that we would have is since these are built off-site and in a factory, that there's really not an opportunity for us, you know, through the construction to, to inspect them like you do on a normal site-built home. So like in a manufactured home or an RV, all of those inspections take place at the factory where they're constructed. There's not the oversight by, by the county looking at that. What we do evaluate in those, in those instances is the tie down and the connection to electrical services and the connection to the sewer service. So in, in that case, if it were built out of state, we would look for a Florida engineer to certify that it met the standard. But, um, and I think that could be done but based on the plans that they built it to. Thank you. And can you help me? A uh, uh, PE in Florida is that any different than a PE in Georgia, Tennessee, Wisconsin, or Wyoming? I, I would have to defer to the PE behind me to <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> the answer to that is, uh, in the case of Georgia, yes, there is a difference, and uh, I don't know about the other states. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, many states have reciprocity, and uh, so if a engineer uh, signs and seals uh, with uh, uh, and, and, can, and can obtain the license from the state that they want to uh, certify to or within, uh, then they can obtain that license for that purpose, and uh, and and at that point it would be identical. So, in other words, if you were an engineer in uh, Kentucky, which I happen to be aware of, has reciprocity. Uh, the uh, uh, you could apply to the state of Florida to get, obtain a license with the state of Florida uh, for the purpose of certifying these structures. And uh, upon receipt of that uh, uh, licensure in the state, you could use it for that purpose. Uh, and you would not have to relocate to the state of Florida to do that. You could stay in 
Kentucky. Georgia does not have reciprocity unless something has changed recently that I'm unaware of. If they, uh, just to follow up on, on that, um, I don't know if you were ever in private practice. Do you, do you have any idea? I mean, people purchase these homes uh, for a variety of reasons. One of them would be uh, the value uh, associated with them. Uh, does, does a professional engineer's, you know, time on this, is this a multi-hour process? I, I, you know, does this take it out of the realm of possibility for someone to purchase? Yeah, I would say that an engineer who had not done that type of work before would probably have to spend a great deal of time on it. Once they've done that one time, they would be able to do it very economically, I believe. Um, and to answer your question about my private practice experience, more than a third of my career was in private practice. Can, can you, um, as, we go, as we go forward, is it, is it your opinion that you know, the ones today may be built to certain standards? Um, I mean, have you looked at any of these? Do we have any idea whether or not this would take older models um, out, of, out of the ability to be located in, in Brevard County, or have they always been built to these standards? I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, Are you going to answer that, Ted? Sure. So um, the standards that we're proposing, just to, to follow up a little bit with, with John's answer and the, and the question before, the, the standards that we're proposing are national standards. So they, would, they should be universal. It's not something that would be specific to Bavard County or specific to us. So engineers should be able to evaluate that, and the plan should be pretty standard. So now the, the, the currently there is no oversight in the construction of the tiny homes that are on on wheels um, the, the the example that we have they have those sort of that the the manufacturer of that they have those certifications and they say that they built it to that standard so I, I can't tell you if the previous ones or other ones meet a standard or don't I don't know that we would without having an engineer's evaluation based on these standards that we would know that for certain. And the standards you discuss, that's the ICC, is that correct? Yeah, the ICC is the International Code Council and there's also the National Electrical Code. Okay. And then the American Society of, uh, I'm sorry, there was the um, ANSI standard, I believe, that we were looking at at one point. To look at the ICC follow-up, According to your report, that standard is 2018. So, uh, so I, I have a tiny home that was built in 2016. Um, how am I expected to have um, a 2016 home meet 2018 standards? In 2016, there were no standards. This, this 2018 standard is something newly created by the ICC, the International Code Council, to address tiny homes across the nation. Is, and it's a supplement or an appendix to the International Building Code. So there, there, it didn't exist prior to pretty much this year. They just adopted it. And, and so help me here. Well, well, uh, so then in that case, if movable roots had built a home in 27, uh, a tiny home in 2017, it would not be eligible for parking in or, or, or having a, uh, a lot in Brevard County because the standards did not exist at the time that it was created. I, I would, you know, we're we're asking that you consider adoption of that as the county standard to apply to any tiny home on wheels. And um, most likely, they, if they were well constructed, they were going to meet that anyway. I mean, they're, they're, they're not overly restrictive standards. In fact, they're a lessening of the building code to accommodate this new type of construction. So I, I don't think the year of the, the adoption of it is, is that critical. So in, in your opinion, potentially homes built prior to 2018 could meet those standards, uh, even even if those standards were not around when it, I, I I'm not familiar with the standards. I apologize. I'm just trying to make sure that we allow older homes to, or you know, older tiny homes to move into Brevard County, and we don't force brand new, brand new ones. So, so I think that they would uh, they would certainly have the opportunity to show us that they did comply 
with those standards. So there would be that opportunity for them. And, and those standards, help me, uh, would you be able to retrofit a, uh, one of these homes or are these paradigm shifts in which, you know, you'd have to tear them up and start over again? I think most of the standards in the ICC appendix could be retrofitted or fit into a, a normal, but be, what we are used to seeing as a tiny home, if that's helpful. Um, the example that we have out in the parking lot, if it were built older, I think most of these things could be met. I see, I see Mike shaking his head. Yeah, that was, that was my next question. Where, <laughs> Madam Chair? Would you like to call him back? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Cheatham. Can you, uh, Michael Cheatham. Mr. Cheatham, are, are, can you address these ICCs? What, what is your opinion? You built homes prior to 2018. Were, you, were your homes to those standards? They're, they're a great thing. The, the, the standards were out for quite a while before they officially got adopted. Uh, there's teams that put a lot of time and effort into making those uh, changes. Uh, so a lot of builders started moving their builds towards that. Uh, you know, knowing that most likely it was going to get adopted into the International Building Code. So, uh, and, and, you know, what, what Mike was saying about the actual codes themselves, uh, for the most part, a talented builder, local builder, something like that, uh, could make the changes to the build if he needed to uh, that would, you know, meet that, that standard. Thank you. And, and there's another one on here. It says it must be anchored to the ground to resist high winds. Uh, do your builds have those uh, capabilities? Yeah. Yes, they do. They, it, all of our trailers are, are purpose-built tiny home trailers. We're not taking a utility trailer and trying to conform it to a tiny home. So they all have 12,000 uh, pound anchors on multiple different uh, spaces on the trailers themselves. So uh, they can be connected to uh, what are called earth anchors, very similar to a, to a mobile home kind of setting. And is that a ICC standard or is that something that you do on top of? It, it's more of a, a industry st standard for for the anchorage so so the homes are, are designed to be mobile so if uh, when we're talking about throws so uh, you know unanchoring it could be something cumbersome so uh, the reality of the units is they have the ability to be more permanent with permanent tie downs to withstand more uh, wind uh, options so a majority of the industry is putting those on their trailers so let me, let me ask you, and, and I know this may be, I, I'm sure you've had time to look at these regulations here as a builder and someone that is comfortable, uh, you know, wh what, would your, what would your suggestion be? I, I understand that, you know, you, you, you know, that you're a business owner, and, but, but from the larger perspective, as other, understand that as other communities move forward, they'll be looking to this. Uh, I'm, I'm for the regulation side of it. I'm for the inspection side of it. Uh, we do use third parties. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's RVIA, there's PWA that kind of uh, sets a standard for uh, how you build uh, an RV, right? Unfortunately, because they're mobile, because they'll have wheels on them, they're classified at the DMV as a travel trailer, correct? So it behooved us as a business then to go after that regulation and make sure that our builds were held to that regulation. Now that Appendix Q has come out, it's also kind of created a potential for a more permanent uh, setting of the home. So that's why some of the standards from the International Building Code have been changed to address things like staircases, uh, uh, living room sizes, egress sizes, you know, those kinds of things are now addressed for a tiny home because they're different than a regular residential home. Thank you. Commissioner Barfield. <clears throat> I have to tell you, that was very interesting. It's nice, very well constructed. I, I looked at it, walked through it, and we have RVs and motorhomes we had for many years, and uh, I, I just really like the way it's laid out. And, and for me, there's a lot of other reasons why I think it, this is important. And I, I shared with Mr. Cheatham out there about this. We're in a situation in our county where affordable housing is 
getting difficult to find. Um, we're at 3.6 percent unemployment rate, which is fantastic. But there's a lot of people working multiple jobs and working in the hospitality industry who really don't ever have that opportunity where they can have home ownership. And I believe that that is important, and I think this gives that option to do that. I, uh, I also believe one of the things I think, I, I think we need to move forward on this. There's been people ask me, well, why are you dealing with this? It's not really an issue now. Um, what, what, why even address this? Well, the point is we need to get out ahead of it and make it some good planning. Uh, I really believe we need to do it as a, in the zoning side. I think we need to look at doing PUDs because I, I really like what the city of Rockledge has laid out any way to do. And I've looked at some of the other cities around the country uh, online and what they've done. And it, it builds a little neighborhood. And that's what's nice. It builds uh, a green space. And we do the PUD what level. You've got your nice green space. You could, you've got neighbors. You've got everything there together. And I think that really is, is fits in great into our community. The, the issue is this, is how do we go about the zoning? And I don't know that we're ready to come up with that decision. I think what would be nice is to send staff back and talk individually with the commissioners and come up with ideas on that. I, I think, uh, I know Mr. Tobias was saying that, you know, we eliminated the square footage for hotel rooms. Well, that's a whole different ballgame. That's commercial, and that's, that's hotels, and that really, in my mind, doesn't have any bearing on what we're looking at here for residential um, home ownership. And so I'm all for this. I, I think this is something that if we get out and do this right, we can do it very well. And uh, a lot of it comes down to the zoning. I'm not really concerned any issues with meeting the standard of, of, of the option three after talking to Mr. Cheatham. And, and actually, any time you put something on the road, if it's a manufacturer, you're going to need to meet the RVI standards or you're meeting the, the Q standards. Now, you have to do that. And let's face it, you're going to have to do NEC standards. You're going to have to do NFPA. You're going to have to do all these other standards that are already out there. You, I, I don't think someone would want to sell something that wasn't at that standard because of the liability they take. So, so I'm all for this, and I, I, I would love to see send this back to staff and using option three and then look at other things we can do on zoning, how we can do this. Uh, I think that needs to be flushed out more. Thank so. you, sir. I, I don't mind the PUD also or the um, new zoning. I, I talked to staff about that, and either one of those two would be fairly clean. But I, I, think, it, I think these need to kind of be, have a, a neighborhood feel when we start being able to develop these, I think they're, they're cool and they're cute. I think the millennials are going to love it. And um, so those are, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Commissioner Isnardi. Yes, I think this is fantastic. I mean, for 150 reasons, it's fantastic. But again, I think uh, we have to be careful if we're going to be talking about affordable housing, if we're going to force these people into a PUD, we know what comes with a PUD. Even a Middle-class PUD has association fees typically, has, you know, user fees, taxes are a little bit higher, and that's what I don't want to do with this. Because if the idea, again, the number one reason why most people would be in support of this, the first thing you think of is affordability. Portability, of course, but affordability. And I just want to make sure that we're not zoning people that would use this option out. Because typically most PUDs, even if it's, you know, fun up-and-coming millennials or, or, you know, people who, you know, do temp temporary work because it is Florida, I, I don't want to box people out if it's, we're going to make this an affordable option. So I think we need to be careful with that. I would be okay, and I know it will probably make some head, spins up, head spin up here, but I would be okay with in any residential area with one of these in my neighborhood because I can... I could name 15 houses in my neighborhood that look worse than one of those houses, in those tiny houses. And it was amazing, by the way, very impressive. Mr. Tobias. I wasn't done. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I, I think most of my questions were answered as far as safety goes and regulations. I mean, unless I missed it in the conversation because it was a bit long. Um, if, if their certified engineer is signing off, it meets the standards and it meets the codes, the ICC codes, that should be sufficient, correct? I mean, it's not something, I don't want to over-regulate it to the point of nauseam, like sometimes governments can do. I don't want someone to go jump through the same hoops that the manufacturers of these 
already are jumping through. Does that make sense? I, I believe that's what we were looking at is okay. that they would have someone certify it and then we would just permit the uh, connections to the utilities. And that's what I thought, but I wanted to be sure. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're trying to accomplish with option three. Right. Yes. Yes, that's what I read. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd be comfortable, my one concern with option three is the Florida engineer. Uh, the reciprocity is, is something that um, expands it a little bit, but uh, Mr. Denninghoff, are you familiar with how many states uh, have reciprocity? Are we talking a majority or? Uh, my recollection is that upwards of 37 or 38 states have reciprocity with the state of Florida. Okay, so I guess that takes, that takes, you're just in trouble if you're in one of the other 13? Uh, yes, if you, if your license is, if you're in a state that does not have reciprocity and that's your only license, then you would not be able to get, you would not easily be able to get licensed in the state of Florida. Okay, and, and w would you be okay as an engineer, uh, if I had the pl I was in one of those states and I plan to sell it to someone in Florida, if I was to send you the plans, would you be able to certify those plans, uh, you know, via email or, or, or a hard copy that would allow me to purchase that home uh, and move it to Brevard County? I would think that that could be arranged. Uh, the The engineer, if some engineers would want to see the actual structure itself to inspect it, others would be, might be willing to do it just based on the plans. At which point they're going to certify that the plans meet the the uh, the required uh, level of uh, quality. But the uh, uh, if if they haven't seen the actual structure to verify that it was built in accordance with those plans, uh, I would personally I would be a little nervous about that. Thank you. And then on the on the zoning, um, I, Mr. Cheatham mentioned, I believe, that he purchased a piece of land and uh, found out that he was not able to put a tiny home on that. So while I think PUDs offer an option, uh, I think that we potentially could expand that and look at other zoning classes, AU, you know, if I have two and a half acres and I don't like other people. Uh, I should be able, I think, be able to put it on there. I yes, yeah, and people don't like me. Very, very good point. Um, very good point. Uh, I don't know about putting these in the middle of residential neighborhoods. Um, and my suggestion was, would be is we look at both ends of the spectrum. We look at the, the PUDs, we look at agriculture, and then if people want to put them in residential, they maybe come to the board to, you know, discuss that for the bulk of the regular residential permitting. And we hear what the neighbors have to say uh, when, it, when it comes to that, because I, I'm, I'm not quite certain, you know, what a th three or 4,000 square foot house is going to want to have a 400 square foot house as a, as a next door neighbor, but right. in a neighborhood, um, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, as um, Commissioner Znardi mentioned, m certain neighborhoods may agree with that type of, of zoning. So if we look at that as a conditional use or, you know, something that the board made determination, but I would like to see not only the PUD, but also, you know, AU and GU uh, also have options to, to put these up. Okay, Commissioner Barfield. It's all good stuff. I think what we need to do is go ahead and I don't know if we table this or send it back. I think you've got some ideas from us what we can do. Uh, you know, and when I was saying PUD, I meant that's one of the things. There's all kinds of other zoning that we need to look at. But I think you get the, the feeling what we're trying to do. So I don't know. Do we need a motion on that or? It's up to the board. Um, I think the staff would appreciate direction. Okay, I make a motion that we. Uh, send this back to staff based on the conversations we've had today and come back with a report to us at your convenience. Okay. So. I have a motion and a second. Commissioner Isnardi. Uh, I just, that's, that's a good idea, Commissioner Tobias, as far as I would like if, if, you know, residential makes people nervous, at least that someone could, has a way to appeal that or I know variance isn't or conditional use or some sort of method to where, because it may be conducive with the neighborhood. Because if you look at an area where I live in, it, 
it would be very conducive with my neighborhood. Okay. But, you know, as much as I don't want, you know, people uncomfortable, if this is, you know, makes someone uncomfortable, and I know you talked about a 4,000 square foot house. I live within a stone's throw of a purple house in my neighborhood. And, you know, that's their property and that's their right. So that's just my two cents. I think we all have a consensus that we like this and we've given you that. So I think what you're going to come back is give us a little bit of help with the, the zoning and, and where we're going to place these wonderful, marvelous homes. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Okay, we're moving into new business. Item A1. Yes. Item A1 is a request for the Board of County Commissioners to consider an appeal from Banana Riverfront LLC of the denial of transportation impact fee exemption for Squidlip Deck Extension. Uh, the Banana Riverfront LLC submitted a letter requesting the exemption of transportation impact fees for a 1,970 square foot deck extension to the Squid Lips restaurant. They claim that no new units were created with this and that the use has not changed and there were no additional vehicular trips created and that the amount of impact fees should be based on the net um, accessible area. So with that, staff evaluated it and found that the uh, new units have been created because there was a deck expansion and the absence of the professional um, traffic study that it, it would be that we were not able to determine if there were additional trips and that the um, impact fees are based on the gross area and not necessarily the net area um, and also the board should note that the assessed fees were the, at the lowest rate for a restaurant. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Ms. Rosenka. Yes. Um, I would request 10 minutes, if I may. If I were in a court, I'd get 15 or 20. <laughs> I would recommend giving her um, enough time to make her presentation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Rosank. I'm with the law firm of Cantwell and Goldman in Coco. I'm here representing Banana Riverfront LLC. With me is Mr. Underhill. He's here to answer any questions. He also has a card in. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas once said, common sense often makes good law. A $33,289 new impact fee for 1,970 square foot of an infill deck on an existing restaurant does not make any sense. This amount has been paid in full and Banana Riverfront is seeking a refund of all or a substantial amount of the fee paid. Banana Riverfront purchased the old lobster shanty in Cocoa Beach on October 16, 2015. The property had been used as a restaurant since 1952. It also had an outdoor deck for seating since 1988. The restaurant was shut down when Mr. Underhill purchased it, and it was in poor shape. After substantial renovations, including the new outdoor decking and bar, it reopened at Squid Lips in February 2016, and the rest is history. I think you all know the rest of that. Um, the life safety plan I presented to you, it's a bigger version. It's a little different than what was in your package, I will admit. And it has the yellow area, which we are claiming is not usable by patrons. And um, that area encompasses... I think it's a 1,110 feet, so we believe only 860 feet of the 970 feet is usable for patrons. 267 feet of that area is the stage for the band. That's the first yellow area on the top. And then there is 800, uh, 843 area is stairs, walkway, and the bar area with a cooler, an area that's not available for patrons. None of that is. The restaurant is very large, it's 10,049 feet. It has a banquet room that is rarely used and two lower rooms which are never used. The new deck does not add new patrons. No new seats were added to the restaurant. The seats actually decreased from the 459 that were there when purchased as evidenced by the affidavit in your packet. It, uh, to, it was reduced by approximately 50 seats. Mr. Underhill is here and he can testify 
if the board wants sworn evidence. Um, I've given you a packet, and it's got quite a lot of information that I, as I was researching this. Um, the first is, why do you have these transportation impact fees? It's in your code, but it's also um, clearly in this first page. The fee is used to pay for capital improvements needed as a result of the new development. This new development of 1970 square feet is infill decking, and it's used partially for seating, partially for walkways. It's actually a redevelopment. It's not necessarily new development. The fee attempts to repay a portion of the cost local entities encounter providing the facilities needed to service the new development. There is nothing being serviced. These impact fees are not going to service squid lips and their new deck. There are no new roadway improvements needed because of the addition to this existing restaurant. I have also in your packet the county ordinances starting at page two. If you look at the intent and purpose of 62802, it's to ensure new development bears its fair share of the cost of capital expenditures to accommodate the impact of the new development. Again, this deck does not cause any new roadway improvements. Uh, the finding, 62803, the existing road system is not sufficient to accommodate new development without decreasing the level of service. This does not apply to infill decking. State Road A1A, a state road, has lots of capacity. I have in your packet the um, 2016 level of service counts at page 4, and A1A in this area has 42 to 46 percent capacity. This is the only road to squid lips. Finding 4, new development should contribute its fair share of new facilities needed to accommodate the new development. There's no cost for these new facilities. Seven, the set impact fee establishes a fair and conservative method of assessing new development. $33,289 is not fair or conservative for this minor addition to this very large restaurant. As fact, as we will discuss later, there are many problems with the way the ITE manual uh, counts trips, which are used for impact fee assessment. 62809B, the independent fee calculation study, which is the alternative in your code to using uh, this schedule in your code. This was not provided to you, and I'm going to tell you why. If you look at that, it requires two sets of documentation. First is, a, is three sets of documentation for traffic engineering studies and two sets of documentations for economic data studies. I spoke to a traffic engineer, Gil Ramirez, and he says in order to do this, he has to have someone sit in front of this restaurant for three days and ask every person that comes in, how far did you drive to get here? This cost for this study would be $10,000. That's just not reasonable or fair for a small business owner. The 62815, that is the code section under which Banana Riverfront um, sought to claim exemptions. Um, we believe exemption A1 did apply, but there's three criteria, and we didn't actually meet one because we did add square footage. Number B, the construction of accessory buildings or structures which will not produce additional vehicular trips over and above those produced by the principal building or use of the land. Again, we believe this is exactly where Banana Riverfront is with this infill decking. The uh, 62816 is the review of the ski fee schedule. We do not know when the fee schedule was last reviewed for, that's in your code. Um, the staff cites to the March 2015 study, but that was three years ago. Uh, regardless, the fee schedule is overly rigid and does not account for the vastly different areas of the county from the very rural MIMS area to the urban Palm Bay area with everything in between in the 72-mile county. In your package starting at page 5 is just the, a few pages of the impact fee study that the staff recommended. I have a portion of it. It's 202 pages. A lot of it also deals with the school impact fees. Um, I don't believe three of you were even on this board if this even came to you for review. I couldn't find it in the agendas in 2015 from March through July. I believe it might have been a consent, but I couldn't go through that. So I don't know how deeply this was reviewed by the County Commission. I know they chose not to increase the transportation impact fee. Uh, but also part of this study, it discusses the legal standards for imposing impact fees, and that's on page 6 of this package. The first standard is that... Um, the fees are proportional to the need. And again, there is no need here. The second standard is that it directs a proportion to the new development, and that's not done by this study either. 
Uh, the other considerations for you to, to think about is, um, number one, a portion of the trips to Squidlips are passerby trips. Starting at page 10 and 11 of the packet, I have an ITERIS, I-T-E-R-I-S, PowerPoint that explains about passerby trips. And again, people do pass by restaurants and stop. We don't know to what extent that is done, and the study, nor your impact fee schedule, accounts for passerby trips. Number two, uh, in your packet at page 13, uh, the American Planning Association has identified eight variables that can result in trip rate reductions. Several of these variables do apply to the very unique location and design of Squidlips. Also, the APA recognized at page 15 of the packet that the ITE manual overestimated peak traffic by an average of 35%. Again, one size does not fit all with this traffic study or your impact fee schedule. Number uh, three, the ITA trip manual does not provide accurate or consistent vehicle trip estimates. On page 17 of the packet, the Portland State University study says that there were error findings in 13 of 23 studies for restaurants that showed actual trips by 26 to 35 percent less than projected by the ITE manual. Number four, Mr. Swanky's denial letter of January 11, 2018 assumes that the increase in square footage will result in an increase of trips. He cites no evidence for his assumption. Number five, challenges in state court are based upon the arguments that the fee obligation fails to advance a legitimate state interest and that it exceeds the cost to mitigate the harm directly caused. Again, the harm directly caused by the new development. There is no harm to the roadways by this new development. Um, I have also in the packet um, a 2009 Florida Bar Journal by Wade Hoppings with Titusville Firm, which some of you may be familiar with, Mr. Hoppings. And it's important that he recognized that it's almost universally accepted that Florida's transportation concurrency system does not work. It creates economic winners and losers. It encourages cities, counties, and the DOT and developers to game the system, breeding disrespect for how we pay for development-created impacts to our transportation. Banana Riverfront requests the entire $33,289 be refunded under exemption 62815A2, based upon the fact that the infill decking did not and will not produce additional vehicle trips. Um, alternatively, I request the assessment be reduced by usable square footage of 1,000, um, added of 1,100 square feet as calculated. Um, actually, the reduction of 11,000, uh, two seconds. So it would be a reduction of $18,759. But the third option is to allow Ben and Riverfront to take out one of the outer buildings and get credit for that. Common sense is seeing things as they are and doing things as they ought to be. It's Harriet Beecher Stowe. I ask that you use your common sense and refund part or all of this impact fee. It just doesn't make sense, nor is it fair. Thank you. Mr. Underhill? If he has if questions. Okay, thank you. We have a slow draw commission tonight. Anybody have any comments or? Commissioner Isnardi. I know I went through the, the staff report. My concern is, again, it's, it's about what's fair. I mean, it, if the existing deck was there and they've reduced their seating in the restaurant, this isn't new development. It may be improved development, but I think that the impact fee is excessive. I know that you guys can't administratively just decide, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and, and cut it in half or we're going to do, but I, I think that this is excessive. This isn't a new restaurant. I mean, maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but. When the deck went in, was that a, a deck that was priorly, I remember walking through this whole process, so, so help me with this step by step. So the new deck went in and we, there wasn't any impact fees applied for for because we, we had that situation we had to work through. So when, when you applied these, you applied them as, as you would for a new addition put onto this establishment. That's correct. The, um, if you remember, 
when they came in with their zoning and we established the use there, there was a um, survey, I believe it was from 2015, that the board said, this is the baseline survey and this is what we will agree that was existing. And then the 1,970 square foot addition is on top of that 2,000, or I should say is an expansion of that 2015 survey. So we, we went ahead in that time, this, this commission went ahead and voted to allow that expansion mm -hmm. and um, for him to, to get those, those items correct. When I was able to ask you some questions, this is the, the part that, that kind of concerned me, is if, if we do this, then we're going to have potentially a lot of people show up then wanting a refund because they're going to want to do net instead of gross also. Yeah, the whole impact fee ordinance is based on the gross calculations. It's based on the gross square footage um, for restaurants, commercial, industrial. It's all based on the gross square footage. Okay. And then in, in the impact fees, it, for, the, for the amount that was in, in effect at that time, it should have been $30 a square foot, but the county only charged $16.99. Can you tell me why? So um, when we assessed the value of the, um, or the assessment, we went with the lowest, the lowest um, classification uh, for assessment, which was the, um, it's what, $16 a square foot. And the, um, what happened was, I think what you're referring to, Commissioner, is when the board last heard the impact fee ordinance, they only adopted the um, $16 a square foot as opposed to what was presented by the, um, the consultant of a $30 a square, $30 a square foot um, increase at that point. Commissioners, if I may, the, the 2015 study uh, indicated uh, support for technical support, legal support for a much higher impact fee for transportation uh, fees. Uh, when the board re-implemented the uh, impact fees uh, or ended the moratorium, we returned to the previously established uh, impact fee levels that were based on the 2000 study, which uh, is what we're using for the schedule. So a single family home, for example, would, would have gone up uh, about a, uh, to about 166% of what uh, it had been had we implemented the 2015 levels. Instead, the board chose to keep them at the 2000 levels and uh, the similar sort of increases would have occurred for uh, restaurants uh, in the case that we're talking about right now. So the board has actually uh, already implemented about a 50% dis uh, discount on impact fees. Thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner Barfield, but before I give it to you, I just want to mention to this commission, I, I think we need to start maybe considering doing a prorated impact fee here soon to start bringing the rates up to what the actual costs are for the county, sir. So let, let me get this clear. So they, when they added on to the deck, they increased the square footage, the gross square footage, correct? Yes, sir. So what they're asking for is to go to net square footage instead of the gross square footage. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So if I understand this, also our uh, fee schedule impact fees is based on gross square footage. Correct? Y yes, the base, the base calculation is on gross. Well, I, I kind of went to look and see what other counties were doing, and I couldn't find one that wasn't doing that. I went through 10 of them. They're all by square footage because of the thinking is that you are including the, all the uh, appliances, appurtenances, whatever you want to call them, all in there. Um, the other thing is I have, a, I have a hard time believing that this is not new development because it increased business. I, 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 I mean, increase business. That's why you do this. So that, that's, to me, is new development anyway. But that's beside the point. The point is this. We can't change the rules right now. Uh, that, that would not be fair to all the people who have come before us and all the people who have come afterwards. If you switch to square footage based on 
net instead of gross, what we'll have to do is go back and relook at those numbers because then we'd have to increase the cost for net square footage because you're not taking into account the whole whole picture. Um, that's like that's like piecing a part of a restaurant and say, well, I added I added one more sink, so that on to that, so okay, that's all I have to do. You can't go to that level. It can get very there I can see the reason why they went to the gross square footage instead of the net square footage. So I, 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 I'm totally, I, I, don't, I just don't see making this, uh, giving this waiver because of that. It's just, it changes the whole rules. That's all. Commission, we have direction. Commissioner Znardi. Yeah, yes, let me let me. Can you go ahead. Oh, first? You can go ahead. Okay, first. yes, sir. Buzz Underell, 490 North Harbor City Boulevard. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. You know, I, I, it's not my, uh, my proposal to do it on a, on a net basis. I think it needs to, I, I realize that it opens up a can of worms and it, and it doesn't make sense. I don't think we should be charged anything, and that's really my position. My position is I don't think that we've done anything to create any impact and that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be charged any any fees if that is not the case then i would like to to look at it upon what's net after i take down a 1200 square foot building that i'm getting ready to take down because i'm taking down 1200 square feet i've added 1970 then if i'm going to be charged which i don't feel i should be charged at all it should be on the difference between the two structures but i i agree with you i don't i don't think you can go from from a gross to a net it doesn't make a lot of sense quite frankly i mean it was an option but i don't you know, I don't buy into it, and I think it creates more problems for, for the county and everybody else to go that route on it. But I don't think that, that it's legitimate that we have created anything that creates any impact that would necessitate this kind of, uh, this kind of impact fee. Um, Please. What's in the 1,200-foot building? I mean, do you, want, you said you would be willing to take it down. What's in it now? Well, right now we're using some of it for storage, but again, if you're going on gross, I mean, it, it, you know, it, then it doesn't really make any difference what we're doing with it. Um, but we're using it, we're using it for storage for some of our equipment, and we'll probably take it out to help mitigate some of the drainage to be able to retain some of that uh, nitrogen that we that we've agreed to do on that. So, um, and we'd be willing just to leave, leave the money until that time until I actually take the building down and then get credit for you know some sort of some sort of arrangement on that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No, sir. Thank you. No, thank you. Can I ask? Oh, Mr. Underhill? Yeah, I want to ask Tad. Tad. I have my light on, but okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Commissioners, in the past, we have given demolition credit towards uh, uh, developments that have demolished portions of their building. We don't give that credit until they actually do the demolition. And the uh, uh, and ordinarily it's actually posed, uh, proposed as part of their site plan so that then when they uh, get all their permits completed their certificates of occupancy uh, done the impact fees assessed would be based on uh, would the basis of the impact fees would include the demolition that took place uh, that has to my knowledge at least not been the case here we as first I've heard that we're going to be seeing a demolition of some portion of the development on the site. Good question. Okay. And again, I, th I think what, what it comes down to, and, and I wasn't even looking at the net gross issue, but this, you see how absurd it can get? I mean, we're going to ask him to, or we're going to suggest or even entertain, and maybe this commission will not, that he take down a 1,200 square foot building he's using for storage that obviously isn't being used as restaurant, eating, or otherwise. Nobody's sitting in the storage unit and nobody's driving to go sit in the storage unit. And it's about impact and it's about what's fair and equitable. So I, I don't know, I mean, it's a technical issue. Does he demolish the 1,200 square foot building to appease the difference in what his impact fees would technically be? But again, we're talking about an existing restaurant and about somebody who's improved the property. 
deck was increased, yeah, but if seating has not gone up, I, I don't see it being a $33,000 impact for an existing restaurant. So again, it's what's fair. That's why they have the appeals process. And we don't have to agree to, to not um, offer some relief here, but we're, or to, we're getting absurd when we're talking about taking down a storage building or even entertaining the idea of taking down a storage building to, to offset the um, impact fee charges. I'm not saying staff suggested that. My, my point is, is that that's, we're going down a silly path if we're, if we're going to consider it. I, I think um, if maybe we came in, that was part of the package, and it was a trade out, and we were trying to consider that. Um, but I, you know, I, I can't go out and, and watch everybody's business and see if it's picked up because of this. I, maybe if there was a transportation analysis, it would help. But for us to sit up here and just try to make guesses of whether this has caused an impact, I, I think the, the safest thing for us to do is stick with the foundation of, of gross and, and try to figure out how we're doing impact fees. I really believe that those impact fees are probably a lot lower than they need to be right now anyways. But um, based on the information right now and, and not having all that put together, I, I don't think I'm going to support this either. But not saying that it couldn't come back later with, with another idea of, of how to, to work that if that happens the way that Mr. Denninghoff suggested. But as of right now, I, I'm probably not comfortable with this either. Mr. Barfield? I have a legal question. If we deny this, can they bring it back again? I think you would have a race judicata issue that you had already decided it. So I would think, oh, I'm sorry, that you had already decided it. So I don't think they could come back again. But you could possibly table it to give them time to come in with their demolition permit and adjust it at the staff level, if that's really what is, is the plan here. Okay, Commissioner Smith. I would suggest one option would be that if the board thinks that the $33,000 is excessive, that you could use your reasoning to reduce that by giving him credit for the 1,200 square foot building that he's going to take down. That way you don't get into a quagmire with a whole bunch of other people coming in here, as has been suggested, that <clears throat> people are going to want to uh, say, well, you know, if he can get a reduction, then I should get a reduction. You have to compare apples and apples. In this, in this case, the apples would be he's reducing the amount of square footage. If somebody else said they wanted to come in and reduce square footage, then they have, a, they have an argument. So I'll just throw that out there. I'm going to think the, the best process for him then is going to be to table this because I can't even go in and I haven't been there. I don't even know if you're doing storage there. You know, you could be get ready to clear it out and open up a whole new area restaurant and then this is just... So anyways, I, my recommendation to the commission is that we, we go ahead and table this and give them time to um, figure out what they're going to do with that other building, see if that is, even is any type of remedy. But if, if that doesn't happen, I, I think the impact fees are fair right now. So, With that, I'll make a motion to table this item. Do we table it to a set date? I think that would be helpful, yes. Okay, what's our next meeting? Um, I, th I think maybe we should wait until July. Fourteen. Okay, I'll make a motion to table this item till August fourteenth. I have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. It's table four to one with Commissioner Barfield in objection. Thank you. Oh, he never does that. That's weird. Yes, uh, we're requesting permission to advertise for an executive session for Price versus Brevard County and Gill versus Brevard County on May 22nd after your regular. Um, BCC meeting. So that's um, next meeting. You want to meet right after, correct? Yes, okay. yes ma'am. Do you need a motion on that, or are you good with yes, everybody? Yes, ma'am. We okay. need a motion. Thank Can you. Can I have a motion for a meeting after the uh, following the next commission meeting with Ms. Bentley? So moved. Have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Commissioner Isnardi, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Passes five zero. 
and we are at new business item 6F1 Commissioners if I may um, this is a, a, a request for seeking uh, RFI which is a request for information uh, for new technology in the disposal of solid waste uh, pretty much garbage what we the last time that we did this was in 2012 and and at that point in time we brought it to the board because we were facing a huge expense coming up which was cell one in in cocoa uh, right now we're we're at the eve I shouldn't say at the eve we're still several years away from another huge expense that will be coming along and it might be time to to look at different technologies to see if there's something uh, better than what we're actually doing which is burying the garbage and more cost efficient uh, what I would and with that um, I would seek some guidance from the board regarding the different technologies and, and whether we should be uh, exempting some from looking at them during the RFI or not but to give you a, a, a better idea of when I'm talking about technology technology is pretty much you got the traditional landfill that we do you got the what we call the incineration incineration is bur burning garbage at high temperature uh, the best uh, thing that you can compare it to is a power plant uh, old style power plant where you burn coal uh, coal in this case you're burning garbage to convert it to electricity and you might have some byproduct of, of steam also there's another type of technologies that is called what they call paralysis and I'm talking in very broad terms and there's a bunch of technologies out there that they call them different things but they do fall within these parameters uh, paralysis is pretty much uh, burning but at very low temperatures and with the idea of coming up with a byproduct that can be used usefully um, the other day you had a gentleman here that, that uh, I can't remember the name of his product but pretty much the product was to dry up the garbage and convert it into something that could be burned in uh, cement and power plants outside of Brevard County because Brevard County doesn't have any any coal plants left of, of this nature uh, the other major one is composting composting you can compost garbage and, and doesn't okay my opinion I'm gonna keep away from that um, composting you can take garbage and, and you pretty much uh, degrade it to the point where you can use it as a soil additive you got to go through the process of taking all the stuff that you don't want out of it uh, good example is, is um, your metals that have some value your glass that has minimum value and and other things of that nature that don't compost very well uh, composting probably will not work very well for construction and demolition like lumber and that kind of stuff because it will take too long to degrade but that that's pretty much it and and some guidance as far as do we put a limit uh, or do we state out there in the RFI what are our costs right now and so everybody that comes along is aware of what our costs are and whether the county desires to go uh, higher than that cost or not one last item is if the county wants to go this route and we do go this route and we use one of our properties for uh, siting this plant I would ask the board to consider a bond just in case the whole project doesn't work so there's money to demolish the structure there's um, one last thing that <clears throat> it was done in, in in the past 
Uh, in the past, what we did, we also restricted that it would be a viable um, technology that had been um, permitted, permitted, not necessarily by the, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, but certainly by EPA, um, because we do know that there's restrictions in other countries that have more restrictions than uh, than the United States and then have less restrictions in the United States. So you certainly want to have something that you don't want to go through this process and end up with something that is not going to get permitted no matter what happens. Uh, so and one last thing that happened in the past and that would be your choice is in the past we have requested that the, uh, there be a viable plant working in the United States permitted already. After that, it would be your guidance. Those are some good suggestions, sir. Commissioner Tobias, I had new light. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would there be any cost to the county uh, for the RFI? You're just talking about uh, man hours, no hard cost. If there's any hard cost, it would be at the tail end to consider the technologies that have already gone through this process and have been um, shrunken down to one or two viable technologies. Commissioner Barfield. Uh, I'd like to make a motion, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait till. I, I think this is a good idea. I really do. Uh, I hate to say that, John, but it's a good idea. So to go do this. But. The, uh, I would suggest, though, we do the RFI. We, we structure the RFI with the intent that at some point we will be doing, going out for a solicitation. And what I mean by that is when we put the RFI out, we open it up where the new technology can come in, whatever it is, but they have to prove it uh, before we ever get to the solicitation stage. Um, I agree with the thing with the... They should have a presence in the United States, yeah. but that's not, they can still respond to us because here's the thing, they may be still in the process of getting their certifications uh, at some point to be in the United States. So uh, I, I don't want to close it too much and I want to keep it out there. And the other thing is, I, I hear what you're saying about incineration, but you know, things, things have come a long way with waste, uh, waste to energy type plants, but still. It has to be economic. But what we need to do is find the technology that best suits what we can do here within our budget. And I think we, we don't, you don't want to come in and narrow that down. We can get all these RFIs on different systems, and then we can narrow it down from there. So that's just my input. So you can make a motion. I think Commissioner Znardi has got a if you. And I know um, I didn't have much support for this in the past, but maybe included as part of the the reasons to do the RFI is to avoid putting that landfill out on 192. I mean, if that's the ultimate goal, I mean, I think I've expressed it pretty strongly before that, you know, that's not the first thing I want people to see when they drive into our county. So, I mean, with the intent of possibly avoiding creating another massive, you know, landfill that we could possibly avoid by new technology, I would like that to be one of the reasons this commission is doing this. And also, too, um, as far as the a viable plant in the U.S., maybe U.S., Canada, you know, places that are close by would probably be more reasonable because Canada has pretty strict regulations as it is environmental and otherwise. So, and it's close enough to where if we needed to put our eyes on something, we could. If the commission's okay with that. Commissioner Smith. Yes, ma'am. Yuri, what, I think I know, but... I want to hear it from you. What is your reasoning that it be restricted to an existing facility in the United States? That wasn't, uh, shall we call it my preference? I, I do have that preference, but that was a preference of, of the committee at, at that point in time in the past. Um, we did not want to get into the situation of for example, what pa happened in Indian River County, <clears throat> that they came up with new technology. The technology was to convert yard waste into ethanol. Um, 
theoretically it works in small production it works when they went to scale it up they had some issues with it and now they got this uh, plant down there that I'm thank God it's not on, on um, county property but it, it's it's not working that's not to say that not all all the technologies are working some some of the stuff that I mentioned um, apart from tweaks here and there from different people the technology has been out there for a long time I forgot to mention plasma plasma is a a, a technology that's extremely high temperatures they pretty much burn the electricity it's very clean uh, it's very expensive uh, but it it works in in small quantities like for example they uh, I think the uh, the US Navy was looking at it for for aircraft carriers um, in Japan it, it exists as a complement to other uh, technologies uh, there, there is really up to this point no one technology that offers all the solutions. It's pretty much what you have. The best system to have, in my opinion, is an integrated system that works regardless of what part fails. But that's my opinion. <laughs> well, in the RFI, we would find out information like that, correct? The Yes, sir, because uh, w one of the things, and I, and I forgot to mention this, just because you, you did not put into the RFI at the beginning, we're looking at technology, we're looking at the possibilities out there. I would not want to restrict a person, okay, you didn't put in for an RFI, now you can't put in for the RFP. Uh, I don't want it to be exclusive. I, I want it to be more broad than... than you know, you have to go through a process, and if you don't pass A, you can't go to B. What are your thoughts to expand to, say, North America, which would include Canada? As long as they have the same environmental uh, or stricter regulations, I don't have a problem. I would have to have somebody research into that. But if, if the regulations are stricter, well, so much better. Thank you. Commissioner Tobias is about to make a motion. I'm, I'm thinking we're going to be very, um, I'm anticipating some good information coming back. I'm guessing what, that's what this process is going to do because I don't even know what's out there right now. So um, you're going to be coming back with a, a different, bunch of different um, processes and, and ideas compared to the cost for doing them. And if it's going to cost the county or if it's going to just be a proprietary um, if you could find someone that will just do it and cover all the costs, that would be great if they got rid of all of our garbage. We've had a couple people come to our office that have just taken all of our dump that they said and they can convert it into gold and roads and everything. So I didn't hear from them again after that meeting, but it would be a wonderful concept. Mr. Tobia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I've tried to integrate what I've heard here because there have been some uh, great suggestions by members of the board as well as staff. So this is kind of a, a, a tenuous motion here as there's many parts, but uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to, you know, have to repeat it. But I'd like to direct staff to initiate the process in order to pursue this information. Uh, secondly, I'd like to approve an evaluation committee consisting of the following staff members, uh, Mr. Denninghoff, Mr. Rodriguez, and Ms. Hayes. Uh, thank you for staying. Uh, as well as putting a scope uh, on this for many of the things that, that we, sorry, that we just discussed. Um, the ability to scale to at least 500,000 tons a year, um, have a 10 currently operating facilities, I just threw that out there, option to have multiple facilities handle trash so the county has the choice to make decisions to reduce trucking costs and road wear. Uh, that will maintain or reduce county expenses uh, and maintain or increase county revenues. Uh, will, a need, will eliminate the need for the county to purchase new or expand existing landfills. Uh, will not require the county to buy or donate land. Will reduce uh, or not increase smells or other negative impacts in comparison to traditional waste facilities. Uh, the, the facility, as you mentioned, must be bonded. 
um, can process all non-hazardous wastes, uh, must emit substantially less pollutants in comparison to traditional wastes, and, and I don't know about the geography here, and I don't know about the um, environmental uh, guidelines of other countries, but I think they must meet, regardless of what other country, they must meet EPA uh, guidelines and whatever guidelines are set up in the state of Florida. As you said, I wouldn't want to get through this process and find out that we couldn't put it in Florida. So I really don't care where it is located as long as it would be allowed under current um, uh, statutes in the state of Florida. So those would be my suggestions for uh, limiting the scope uh, so we don't end up with thousands of different proposals. Yes, yeah, so th that would be something that, that we could do, yes. Okay, Mr. Bate. <clears throat> the only item, uh, just to make sure I, I get it clear, because we wouldn't be costing the county any money. Um, I understand that part, but the uh, for in terms of the tipping fee and what we're currently paying for a tipping fee, uh, should we be assuming that it would need to stay flat and, and so that it wouldn't be an additional charge? Uh, correct. I, um, there, there's, a, there's a difference between tipping fee and cost. It's, it's not the same. Um, when, when you, th there's a difference between increasing the cost to the citizens and increasing the cost to, to, of operating the business. The, the department not only has a cost of handling that tonnage, but also there's, there's a cost of overhead and, and for other services that we pay to, to the county departments, plus the uh, money that we separate for future closure of the landfill. So when, when, we, got, when we talk about costs, we've got to make cognizant of which one we're talking about. Uh, the only problem that you run into is when your total costs exceed your revenue, which is what we don't want to do. <laughs> so I, I'm more than willing to pull out uh, the will maintain or reduce county expenses, maintain or increase revenues. We could get all proposals and then have you aggregate that data and then, then tell us in you know, your opinion. That was just my suggestion to, to, to throw out here based yeah, on... Yeah, Commissioner, I, I, I think that would be best because at, at the end of the day, a technology might come along which might cost 50 cents per ton more or a dollar per ton more, but somebody else is taking the risk of the technology, so we got to ask ourselves, is that 50 cents or a dollar more? It would increase our cost. It would not increase the cost to our citizens, but we could absorb it internally, but they would be assuming the cost of, of, um, of running the risk for the new technology. So uh, on, on that, I'd like to amend my motion to eliminate the, uh, the uh, criteria uh, maintain or reduce county expenses, maintain or increase revenue. We'll see what uh, responses we get back and then determine it from there. Okay. We have a good motion on the board. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you, Yuri, for all your work. We have no public comment cards, so I'm going to move ahead to board reports. County attorney. No report. County manager. I have two quick items. The first is uh, we received an email from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that they're creating a management plan advisory group for the St. Sebastian Preserve State Park and they've uh, requested an appointment of a representative from Brevard County Board of County Commissioners to be on that advisory group. Um, if the board likes, we have talked internally, staff has, and we would recommend that the board uh, appoint, make motion, and approve uh, Mike McKnight as the board's appointee to that uh, advisory group. He's the EEL program manager. 
Okay. Do I have a, a motion to appoint Mr. Mike McKnight? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Isnardi. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. And the second item would be um, we do not have a uh, subject for the May 17th uh, workshop, so we'd ask the board if uh, you'd like to make a motion and cancel that workshop. Can I have a motion to cancel the workshop? So moved. Can I have a second? So all in favor to cancel, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Abate. Commissioner Isnardi? Uh, yes. Um, I only have one item. I don't know if um, I'm sure Commission has seen the emails going back and forth a little bit about the airport. Yes. You know, um, so that sort of started in my office. And, you know, with uh, Commissioner Tobias' indulgence as well, um, he said that we could go ahead and try to manage that. And since there were a lot of issues that the staff was looking into and there's some issues with tenants, I just want to ask, because we have an audit in place, that um, if it's okay if us as a board directs staff to not allow any major movement at the airport at this time in regards to people's leases and that sort of thing, because apparently there's been some issue with because without going into a lot of detail, because I don't want to um, influence what what we're looking at right now, you know, there there may be a tenant or two that feels like they're being scrutinized because they've brought some issues of complaint about what's happening at the airport, and I don't want to see, um, or at least there would be the perception of any kind of punitive response. So I, again, and this is you know a gentleman that's been there for many, many many years so it's not like it's some new guy that's trashing the place but until the audit is concluded I just don't want any major movements made on anybody's leases is basically the bottom line Commissioner I don't have a problem with that except that I do want to make sure that we're not going to endorse or allow violation of FAA rules which would no and I wouldn't funding. suggest that I'm talking about something else separate of that I'm not I understand but I, I want yeah. to make sure that others may also not uh, misunderstand yeah, this that, is has that, nothing to do with the pancake yes, breakfast the, the, this has the, more to do with their lease than it does the pancake and, breakfast and I don't think we have a problem with that at all okay all right and is Commission okay with that do we need a motion or anything or just do you need a motion? Okay. Okay. 87. We're good. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Smith. No report. Commissioner Tobia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to wish uh, everyone, including a couple people up on this board, a happy Mother's Day, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for all you do, and 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 the many times I forget to say uh, to notice. I I do. I just forget to to mention it. So thank you, mothers out there. Thank you, Commissioner Tobia. That's very nice of you. Mr. Barfield, no report. you had an opportunity to top that. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> okay, and I have no report either other than happy Mom's Day to all you moms out there. This meeting's adjourned. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.